Paul Bunyan's steps there on the sidewalk, and it reminded me of, in 1952, I guess, when I was a student here, uh, how uh, a few of us uh, were able to abscond with Paul, put him on the side of a uh, van and drive across the quad while the uh, forestry students were watching in awe. And uh, we had it designed so that if they pursued us, we had road blockage down on uh, uh, Fourth, Fourth uh, North and Sixth East, so that uh, they, we could escape. I'm sorry to have to report that to you. That's not a good way to start, but his steps reminded me of that little incident. Well, Ken has given you a little uh, uh, introduction uh, of what we might talk about today. And uh, before we, we begin the formal discussion, I'd like to just uh, uh, share with you uh, a challenge. And that is, whenever you're developing something that's fairly generic, as soon as you show a specific example of that, many people will say, well, that's not my field of discipline. Mine is over here. And they have a difficult time transferring from the model example you show to something that's in their own discipline. So I hope that as you, uh, as you view what I'm doing, showing about some things in the industrial manufacturing world, you'll be thinking about its application in your field, whether it's agriculture or uh, agronomy or, or study of artworks. Uh, we, we at once, uh, one time, started collecting files of information showing how this could be used from A to C, from artwork to zymergy. Uh, didn't know too much about art, art parts, but I've studied those and we developed a classification showing how it fit in with the taxonomy. And then I got into zymergy. And all I knew it was the last word in the dictionary. Anybody know what zymergy is? Last word in the dictionary, right? <laughs> and I started studying about it and found out it's a uh, it's the study of fermentation processes. Uh, it's uh, how you make bread and yeast and chocolate and, uh, and beer and wine. So I was asked to give a presentation at BYU on this, and I was over to the BYU library looking up beer and wine making when one of the fellows came in that asked me to give the talk and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I'm learning about fermentation processes. Now we can put it in the taxonomy. And he was anxious a little bit. <laughs> what well, might be saying down there? Anyway, it went over all right. But I found out that Zymergy is re really the basis of life processes. So it's something that we ought to be studying about. Well, I'll, uh, I'll, if Ken will turn the lights down, I'll go over here and... Uh, See if I can see how to make all this work. This is about like the system we had over in the engineering. I taught here for four years after I retired from BYU, so I still have a. I, I still like blue and white. Uh, where do you go? All right. Um, One of my professors, Fred Prater, when I studied in the building just south of Old Main, called the Mechanic Art Building, said to us, without the process, there is no product. And I remember that. I haven't remembered very many things in my study here, but that's one thing that I remember. And uh, there are many kinds of things or products. Uh, some people like to look at uh, animal, vegetable, vegetable, and mineral, as they do, divide, uh, discover, and de describe things. Others like to look at person, place, or thing. Uh, maybe you want to look at event or act or action.
action or process. In any case, these things help to uh, guide us into the discovery of, of relationships. Because uh, uh, the process is so important, it seems like planning that process should be important. And so one of my assumptions as I began my career uh, teaching was that if there's one thing the student should know in manufacturing, it's how to make things. Now in your, dis your own discipline, there must be at least one thing that's pretty important. You ought to discover what that is early on. So if, if uh, the, plan, the process is so important, then planning that process ought to be important as well. Uh, now, in the context of this, I was involved with an organization called CAMI International, and we had a project called Process Planning Project. There, people from around the world were studying this, uh, this issue, and they found out that uh, the plot process planners with 10 more years of experience was diminishing quite rapidly. And at the same time, they found out that the, uh, the average time for producing these plans was increasing. That's a, not a good situation to be in. So that was some incentive to help... Uh, do this work. So there was this process planning project and uh, corporations around the world were putting money into uh, funding projects to help discover ways to do this. And there was a program that was called Variant Process Planning. It was quite widely used uh, developed at California Traction Company. Now, we were more interested in the generative uh, concept of planning. How do you generate things. So you, you have 20, 26 letters in your alphabet, and with those we can generate quite a lot of words. If you have to store all the words, that's a fairly big uh, storage. But if you can generate those from 26, then you can do some interesting things. So as Ken mentioned, I gave my students there were some students waiting there in the wings. They'd been through the program called Manufacturing Technology at BYU. They were in their second year when I showed up. And so they were just waiting to finish off a few uh, advanced courses and get their degree. So one of the assignments I gave, along with that idea that uh, process planning must be important, is, as Ken said, how do you prepare the operation plan for making parts in, say, quantities of 25 or less? Well, uh, so that brought the problem here. I was going to, I scanned this in, and it's a little, uh, it looks like it's got dust on it, it does. I asked my granddaughter if I ought to clean it up, and she says, no, that looks old. And, uh, and really it is, it's quite an old picture, but it shows the, uh, we gave them an assignment, all the students the same assignment, to make that little part, and they came up with all these ten ways. And each one would work. So the question is, is one better than the others in some way? In terms of either quicker throughput, or lower cost, or better quality, and if so, could we find that one, and then how could we help each student achieve that very best plan independent of their background or experiences or biases or whatever. So as Ken said, that, that was a long journey. But during that journey, we had lots of fun. We found so many interesting things to do. Now, the reason that it's important to have a good plan is because once that plan is made, it's distributed all over the shop, all over the factory. Yeah, copies go to for scheduling, to industrial engineering, to deal with the time studies and the, so on. The tool design starts making the drawing, quality assurance planning, numerical control programming, process engineering, shop floor, etc. So once that goes out, it's beginning to have a big effect on the whole enter enterprise. And if it's wrong or less than optimum, 
the enterprise can suffer. So that was that was a, a good motive to do this. Now, as Ken indicated, there are ways that you can capture logic and, and store it for reuse. One is to write programs in a computer, and uh, and that's quite a lot of work. It's hard to uh, sometimes debug and maintain the software. We spend lots of money on software, and then ten years later, you go back and think, well. Now, what did I get from that? There's hardly any vestiges left of some of this old software that we spent so much money on. The, the Air Force had a program called APT, Automatic uh, Program Tools, that was developed at MIT in the good night. In, in the, the mid-1900s, uh, uh, for, for controlling machine tools to get repeated parts, they spent 200 man years of effort on designing that software. Not around anymore, but that was a big expense. The second level might be called decision tables. These were introduced in 1950 uh, or thereabouts, uh, where you could uh, store your, your logic for making decisions. Uh, you, you could uh, identify the conditions down here and say, if I have this condition and this and this, and then the rules for that, and then a, a, a little mark here to perform this action. And those were highly touted as being self-documented. You didn't need to write computer code. Uh, you didn't need to document. It was just logical uh, work there. And then the third one was the tree logic, where you can set up decision trees, and we'll talk more about that one. Now we've discovered one nice thing, and that is that the, the decision table could be converted into a decision tree, where you, you define each of the conditions as you would down here, and you have the, the rules here, and then the actions are out on this line. Now this was a little nicer for us because you could go, if you wanted, you could go into a further depth out in here where it's awkward to go into more depth in any of these categories of balance. Now with decision uh, tables, you can make a call. This, this call here might be to another decision table. But by the same token, we can call other trees. And in fact, we can call itself if you want to. So there's some nice recursive capabilities there. Well, uh, the next uh, principle or premise, I guess, was that the process planners would have a greater likelihood of choosing the best plan if they knew what all their options were. Is that a fair statement? Yeah, it is. And the same with you. If you don't know what your options are, it's difficult to know if you're making the best choice. So how do you how do you find out what all the options are? Whoops, I wanted to go back one. I asked one of the uh, botany professors at BYU. I read a little article that he was having a computerized thing with the taxonomies, and I called him up and I said. Could, would it be possible to make a taxonomy of manufacturing processes like you do for living things? And he said, oh no, taxonomies are for living things. And so I said, well, the process is another of the product. Uh, without that, there would be. So I said, I'll, I'll go ahead anyway and see what happens. So we weren't discouraged by that advice. Maybe we should have been because it took a lot of work. But at any rate, we found out that there are a lot of people that, uh, that do taxonomy. Uh, zoology people, biology people. Then there's a group of doctors who study diseases. It's called nosology. And then there's uh, the librarians. They classify all kinds of things. We had the Librarian of Congress at BYU one year, and I showed him what we were doing, we made a fatal mistake. We showed him the Dewey Decimal classification tree, 
and he was trying to introduce the Library of Congress tree. He didn't see that we were doing the same thing but with just a different classification. So he was not too impressed. But we found out that there's a, in years ago, I don't know if any of you have studied mass set theory, but that was a setup of normalization. Uh, the database management people have first, second, third, fourth normal forms in their work. So there's a lot of people that do classification. The only thing is they don't talk to one another in different disciplines. And so they don't share ideas with one another. So we, we studied these different disciplines. We started finding out some interesting things. But one of them is that you need to write down all the things that you want to classify. Just make a list of all the things. And then you can start to group those. Maybe this one and this one and this one are sort of related. You just kind of group those. And then maybe you can put some names on those groups here, and you begin to uh, build a taxonomy or a hierarchy of, of things. Uh, in the engineering field, they use a thesaurus, which gives you two or three levels deep of uh, engineering kinds of terms. And uh, But at any rate, this, this is uh, how you, you go about it. Now, we studied what some of these other folks have said about classification. Here's by, one by uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson. It's called Man's Oldest Profession. To the young mind, everything is individual, stands by itself. By and by, it finds how to join two things and see in them one nature. Then three, then 3,000. It goes on trying to tie things together, diminishing anomalies, discovering roots running underground. Since the dawn of history, there has been a constant accumulation of classifying of facts. Classification is the perceiving that these facts are not chaotic. And that's what we want to do. We want to see the relationship with those. Uh, Simpson said the most basic postulate of science is that nature itself is orderly. That's wonderful, isn't it? We can plan on things that are going to happen. He said, in taxonomy is another science that the aim is that of that the ordering of science shall reflect an order of nature. Taxonomy is a science exclusively devoted to the order of complex data, and in this respect it has a special, a particularly aesthetic, and almost a super scientific place among the sciences. Now, how many of you studied classification? Anybody in here? Maybe we ought to be doing that a little bit more. It seems like it would be a good thing for us to, to, to know our fields, to know our disciplines, to know the relationships between things. Black Welder said people who study the process of thinking tell us that classification is involved in judgment, memory, problem solving, inventive thinking, aesthetics, perception, concept for me in formation. Is there anything else the mind can do? And one more. Uh, Conant said, only to the degree, the degree that new ideas are introduced into the systemization of factual information does the activity partake of the nature of the work of these investigators we readily identify as great scientists. So you need to be able to as you analyze this, begin to see patterns and relationships, put names on them. Sometimes you have to invent names, uh, introduce new terms to the field, but it is a way to bring things together and to see what the possibilities are. And then it's very easy to introduce someone not acquainted with your discipline to what it's about, what, what you're all about. So I, I encourage you each in your own disciplines to do a little bit of this. Now, as we uh, we gave a demonstration on this down. Uh, uh, well, I, first of all, I hired a a student uh, uh, to help me write a, some software. We wanted a decision table processor. There were some Available, written in COBOL uh, in those early days that weren't very good. You 
expensive, six to nine thousand dollars a copy to buy the software. Punch cards. Uh, so I asked Ron Millett if he would help write some some software for a decision table processor that we could put our put to use. Uh, he 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 was involved in some linguistics work, and uh, and I was involved in building taxonomies, and we discovered that we could build a decision tree processor. that would have greater capabilities than a decision table processor. So that's what we did. We gave a presentation down in uh, Texas at one of these meetings uh, for Cam Mike. One of the vice presidents of Boeing, a uh, commercial airplane company, saw me and said, why don't you come and work up in Seattle for a, a summer? And I said, well, I'll think about it. I asked if I could bring my student up. And so we put together a demonstration system up there. We worked on it and knew how things would work. The one that would be amenable to their needs. And uh, as we were building these decision trees and other kind of classification trees, we discovered there's a whole variety of trees. The first one is called an exclusive branching type tree. That means it's either rotational or not. Those are the two options. If it's rotational, it's centric or concentric or gear log, we said. Now, if this is right, if this is correct here, then the chances of this being correct are better. If this is wrong, then further branching doesn't make it right. So you need to get your foundations up. And then the non-rotational parts, the kilometer, sheet, box-like, or other. Uh, so these are, it's one or the other. And when you choose one, you can put a, a one here and a zero here. And if you choose that one, you can put a one there, and then there's zero, zeros, and these are the zeros. So we have a little, I call it a DNA code for this process. So it allows you to have a little bit string that describes these things. Now, the next one is uh, one that's, uh, that didn't work, good. okay, thanks. The next one, as we studied what other zoologists and biology people and other taxon, we discovered that there's things and then there's attributes of things. And if you mix those together, sometimes it makes it confusing and complicated. So we tried to separate the attribute. For example, one feature of a part would be that it might have a chamfer or a groove or a hole. The hole could be axial or radial or a thread or a set. So, and you can have as many of these as you want. So you could have features and treatments on your part. You could have chamfers and grooves and holes. You could have a heat treatment such as a hardening. You could have a deburring and a vector painting. So you could have all those and those would have bit strings on too. So you end up with a string of data that describes that thing. And uh, you can do a logical handing, fastest computer operation to find anything like that. And you can truncate this, the bit string as you want to find others most similar in the database. Okay, so those are types of things and attributes. Uh, and we call these entries because they were not mutually exclusive branches. Then we, then we call the one where you combine those, showing both types of things and attributes of things, a combination tree. In other words, you can trans traverse the tree down to here, or wherever you're going, and then it's as if this were put on the end of that, on the end of each of these, because now you can describe more things about that individual item. It makes it very compact to define that. Now, uh, these attributes uh, are, they're not a thing. For example, is a hole a thing? I mean, can you buy post holes anywhere? Uh, you, you, so it's an attribute of something, uh, a finish, texture, color. Color is an attribute of a thing. It's not a, you can't have a green, you can't have a green, 
something or other sweater. Then we found out that we needed to sometimes evaluate mathematical expressions in our trees. And of course, you can write programs to do that. And there are many out there. But we thought if we could build it right in, then we could, based on the assessment, it might help us to branch down a certain branch. So we set up one. Here's one to calculate the drilling horsepower of your drilling. So we put in here, define the material. And as soon as we define the material, it sets what the cutting speed would be. And then we put the diameter in the feed. We, we first enter the diameter here. And then this percent sign means that you go down here next. And it would, on ascending order, choose if it's a diameter of 0.25, then it would set the feed rate at 5,000 feet per revolution of the drill. And then it would come down here and calculate the amount of uh, material, let's see, uh, it would calculate well, the, the feed rate, the area, the cubic inches per minute, and the horsepower based on this unit uh, horsepower up here. So it's just an automatic tree. You just put in the diameter and uh, what the material was, and then calculate and say this is how fast the drill should go. Uh, how much horsepower it takes, and, and so forth. And then uh, the next type is the decision tree, and there's different varieties of that. I won't go into those, and I'll let Ken introduce you to those, but I'll show you one example. Uh, here's uh, where you, you define the present state of the material, raw material, bar stock, or a, forging or casting. And then the condition is a round, hexagon, uh, another condition. Is it less than two inch diameter? Is it less than four inches long? If it is, then the action is face one end, cut off the length, face the second end, and drill. So those are just little things that you can put together and build a pattern of instructions for somebody that has to do it manually. Okay, the next one was, uh, we, as we uh, started, we, we developed the software that worked fine at the point, and uh, they were our first customer. Uh, next, we tried to sell this idea, it was 200,000 lines of Fortran code, sell it to other companies. And we thought we'd charge $25,000. Nobody wanted to buy it until we doubled the price and then it started to sell. Uh, they found out that it was serious and it had to get a uh, serious uh, commitment from the companies uh, to do that. It wasn't petty cash anymore. And uh, so we started selling one of the customers at Westinghouse. And this is, as I went through my slides the other day for getting this ready, I found this old one. And it, but it kind of shows how you can get together as a group and begin to share ideas and and it takes a little effort to build a, a classification. Um, I was also involved with the standards committee with this group, uh, CAMI, uh, International Standards. We had people from various nations getting together talking about standards for, for manufacturing. And I, uh, I inherited from a man named Shizori from McDonald Automation Company. I'm indebted to him for this model. He, he said that if you have activity A and activity B, inter 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 information is passing between those, you can look at that as an interface, as a node. And he says you can have these standard nodes where communication takes place, but he said you can have many paths, many ways to skin the cat. And he said, this is where invention takes place, and you don't want to standardize and inhibit invention, but you do want to provide standards to remote communication. Does that make sense? OK, so we started looking at examples for those. The part name, uh, part, excuse me, part number, how many digits is it? Is it 5, 6, 10? Uh, the name, the, the material. The, 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 how a group it belongs to, finish requirements, all these kind of things. We started setting up standards. We created a data dictionary kind of a thing. And it doesn't require an infinite number of standards. A couple thousand will go a long way in driving the transactions of the manufacturing enterprise. But unfortunately, 
unfortunately, we still haven't got them yet. Now, I can't quite remember how this idea came about, but uh, we were we were engaged in this work trying to help find the best process. But we discovered that if the design had problems with it, it would make it expensive. Uh, we found out if they chose the wrong material, it would make it expensive. So our goal was to get an uh, initial design defined, choose a tentative material, see what processes that would do, and iterate that until we could come to there. Uh, so that was the approach. And then, as I was teaching the engineering students a few years ago here, I said, this needs to have one more circle around it, and that's the business enter uh, environment. That's your market. How many do they want? When do they want them? How much are they willing to pay? And then these decisions can uh, take on uh, better focus. So uh, we discovered in our work uh, uh, that uh, there are two kinds of classification. One is called a monocode and one is a polycode. Basically, uh, here we would have stored the external shape, then the internal shape, and then the features, the size, whereas here we would have uh, these defined in a, in a more hierarchical way. And there's arguments, pro and con, we didn't care which way, because you can get the same code out of any, any one of them. So we said, well, you know, our, tech, our technology would accommodate each one. Now we found out one other principle, and that is you want to keep the code short, for example, we found the zip code, five digits, social security number here, population on the earth here, number of stars in the galaxy here, number of stars in the universe here, company 18 digit count number there. <laughs> <laughs> so try to keep your codes short because they're easier to process and you don't make so many mistakes and so forth. Now we, we designed as we got into this, what we call the transportable database structure. We were trying to build generic taxonomies for families, materials, process, equipment, tooling, so that companies could quickly uh, adapt these to their own situation, rather than reinventing from ground zero every time. So we put a lot of effort into that one. Um, one of the things we talked about in defining shapes is that we have certain primitive kind of things, and that cylinder, if you stretch it out 200 to 1, the length and diameter could be called a wire. Here it's a rod, shaft, cylinder, or disc. They're all the same. If you store them in a computer, all you have to do is change the LD ratio, and you've got a different thing. You don't have to store all those pieces. Um, and we discovered that you can put some of those together, excuse me, make a composite area, out of that, and you could make it longer or shorter, whatever. And then you could, there are certain form features. We found that there's about 80 form features that are added to parts to allow them to perform certain functions, such as here. And you can add those on here. So by storing, identifying a story of a few basic kind of things, we can generate a lot of nice, interesting things out of that. Uh, we also found that we could create a three-digit code to describe the 240 basic shapes, uh, put the form feature, size, precision, material, so we had a very short code that could be used for all kinds of downstream planning. In terms of the basic shapes, this shows, again, we talked about uh, rotational and non-rotational, this uh, uh, solid or hollow, round, round of deviations, uh, straight cylindrical, single ID, or uh, three or more diameters, progressive steps, variable steps, anyway. It takes a fair amount of work to do this. There were a lot of companies out trying to define this for at that time. And then our, our major work was to define <laughs> the process that would change, transform these raw materials into finished products. Well, we spent a lot of work on this one. 
uh, define the process that would change the shape or the properties or the finish. And uh, in fact, we uh, got a little consortium of eight companies, uh, and we worked for about five years. We developed a 17 volume set of, of training materials for students and people in the industry on these various processes. Now, we, we'd like to talk to people that here we're building a, a record player. We've got the tools that can play your records. And you, the records are really the trees. We're trying to communicate what we have with this one. And the basic architecture in the old days was here was the, the source the code, an interface module to the main line, the database, management system, the database, and then these special application programs, which would take the data from running these trees and generate reports or whatever. Uh, Ken has uh, kept this alive. Our, our patent on this was in the mid-80s, and uh, we had some challenges with uh, trying to run a business on campus, so we took it off campus, and the people who ran it didn't do it too well. It went from $80,000 a month to zero in a short time. And, uh, but Ken has kept it alive, and he's now put it into a JavaScript so it'll run on more modern computers. And uh, so uh, I hope there'll be some applications for that. I still think it's a useful technology. So from the user view, you'd have a you'd have a sketch of the part. Now you generate those on the computer. Then you go into the classification coding. And then you find similar parts. And then the decision is, should we use those, or should we make it from one of those, or is it we're going to make a new design? And so what's happening down under the system is kind of shown under here. So here's, uh, here's our first effort at Boeing. Uh, they have this part, hydraulic bracket. These were for uh, 747 aircraft parts. And uh, I think Ken is going to show you a little uh, video clip. I uh, don't have very many artifacts left over from those days, but he's going to show you a little clip of what Boeing talked about and how they were engaged in classification. They had a lot of people involved in that. This would be 1976, probably before you uh, Classifications, or BUTS classifications, 
are organized systematic methods to classify the resources, information, and products of the Boeing Company. Classification systems which are operational or under development to support the various systems <coughs> include Boeing designed piece parts or dash numbers, perishable tools such as drills and cutters, raw materials used in production, purchased items like fasteners and electrical components, assemblies and installations of two or more detailed parts, software programs and routines, that is, to find out what the computer produces, time standards for manufacturing operations, machine tools within Boeing's capital equipment inventory, manufacturing applications of classifications and coding, and computer manipulation of classification systems. Classification is generally defined as a technique for grouping like items together by virtue of their similarities. As an example, this small population of items can be grouped by the corresponding shapes. Objects with corners form one family. Those without corners form another. Each generalized family can then be subdivided into more specific categories, triangles, squares, circles, and ovals. Placing like items together in families provides the opportunity to retrieve, compare, and make improvements. This approach used within Boeing for classifying industrial information is known as hierarchical classification. A historical example of hierarchical classification was developed by the Swedish botanist Carolus Linnaeus over 200 years ago when he was classifying living things in nature into families of flora and fauna. Each family of items was classified in hierarchical tree form by similarities until unique groupings could be achieved. Simple binary or yes-no logic was used to arrive at single branches on the tree. Boeing uses this approach to classify designs, materials, hardware, and software populations. So here's a sample part from Boeing. Keys that were 
previously said, it would ask the question, is it, uh, uh, is it uh, contoured or bent? And it would be bent, so that would choose this one. Is it straight or curved? This would cause that choice to be made. One bend or uh, not here. And so it would say break form it. That means to bend it in a big press break. And then it would uh, come to the other end, come down here, and then we'd go through this one. And it would choose these, and it would say shear it and pierce it. And I'll tell you part. So it generated a plan that says break form it, shear it part, and then pierce the holes in it. Now, from that, there, you know, you can embellish it more and more, and then generate. This was in 1978. Uh, up at uh, Seattle, Ray Thompson was involved there. So it was one of their first things. So this is kind of a world's first generative process planning system. When we were able to store the, the structures and the keywords and generate those. And then you could uh, turn off the automation features if you had a new person that wanted to see the decision logic that went on behind that automatically. Uh, so, so anyway, that was a, an approach. One of our other customers is Westinghouse, and they set up one called the YCAP system, following a similar kind of a thing. And they generated a plan for making printed wiring boards. Their uh, assessment of this was that they could save a million and a half dollars a year, uh, a lot, quite a good saving on design, uh, not reinventing the wheel. Uh, they could save 20 to 25 percent on estimating the cost, and up to 75 percent on process planning. So it seemed like a reasonable thing, and because of that, we would hold annual meetings where people would come together, share their ideas. Uh, I was very excited with the Xerox when they came, and one of the ladies who was working there showing how you could use with this with a computer-aided design system. Generate the designs and classify them at the same time, then pass that data over to production and planning. Okay, now we have another little video. Okay, Would, are there any questions uh, that you'd like to ask at this time that uh, that I might answer. I cannot answer all of them. I guess some I don't know. Any anything that comes to your mind? Well, we have just a, a short video that some of uh, our guys put together a few years ago uh, that tells a little bit about how this all operates, and then uh, I guess that'll be about the end of the. Yeah. yeah, so this is how long? Seven, seven minutes? Okay, so why don't we run that one? Now, this isn't perfect, but uh, hardly anything is, so. Just had to do something. He had to find some way to duplicate across the company the things his star performers were doing. And more if it... So Big Wheel sent out a high-powered search team. Their task? To come back with a solution that would solve the company's problems fast. And that's just what they did. What's that supposed to be? Just an acronym, sir. D-Class stands for Decision Classification Information System. It's a computerized system designed by Dr. Del K. Allen and Ronald Millett at Brigham Young University. And it processes all kinds of information to help handle classification, searching, retrieval, and advanced decision-making problems. Just the kinds of problems we have. You can use D-Class to retrieve parts or items based on given specifications. That's one way a large company we talk to uses D-Class. 
When a new design is required, the company retrieves and uses components of past designs. That way, there's no duplicated effort. It keeps costs down. It's also possible to use advanced logical searching techniques to select a process or object based on many constraints or conditions. For example, let's say there are 925 objects in a database. By specifying certain conditions and performing logical operations such as AND, OR, and NOT, the number of objects meeting those conditions are identified. Some of the companies we visited use D-Class for solving algorithmic decision-making problems. What kind of problems? Problems involving a step-by-step -step process, such as generating process plans. D-Class is great for solving this particular kind of problem. Boeing, Caterpillar, Texas Instruments, and Westinghouse were some of the first companies to use D-Class for this purpose. And look at what another multinational corporation is doing. They've applied D-Class to estimating with phenomenal results. In one case, they decreased their turnaround time of one and a half hours per estimate to just five or six minutes per estimate. That's based on an average of approximately 600 estimates a month, and it's a monthly savings of about 500 man-hours. How many companies did you find using D-Class? Quite a few. The list of D-Class users has grown over the years to include major corporations throughout the world. Most of them are Fortune 500 companies, like Xerox, Eaton, and Rockwell International, and the list is growing. While visiting these other companies, we discovered one of the useful elements for solving problems is classification. Like Howard Phillips said, classification not only assists the memory by arranging individuals into groups, it also expresses the relationship of things and leads to the discovery of their laws. D-Class helps classify, code, and retrieve. And to do it, it uses logic structures called trees. Trees? Like this one. It was developed by a consortium of seven companies and three universities as part of a large project to classify equipment parts and tools. But wait a minute. Slow down. What exactly is a tree? A tree is just a framework for information. To be more specific, a tree's framework is a structure of branches and nodes. They order information in a logical sequence to be traversed in order to select an appropriate decision. Branches contain the information and are arranged in parent-child configuration. Nodes are the decision points that, when selected, determine the logical sequence or path through the tree. At the node shown here, there are four decision points. As you may know, decision trees were first used in biology for classification of plants and animals. More recently, trees were used in business for decision-making and were called decision trees. Now D-Class allows us to computerize trees for classification, retrieval, and algorithmic decision-making purposes. Right. D-Class allows users to process trees manually or automatically in lots of creative ways. It's kind of like records in a phonograph. Just as you can play different kinds of records on a record player, you can process different types of trees with different applications on the D-Class system. Only the computer is a lot more sophisticated than a record player, so it can capture data off the trees to do such things as generate a process plan, identify locations, and make estimates. So, how do these trees work? Here's a small algorithmic tree used to choose the right size press to bend sheet metal. Even though it's small, it demonstrates some of the features of larger working trees. This part of the tree allows you to select the type of metal to be bent. When this is displayed as a menu on the monitor, the parent branch information is the prompt and the child branches are the choices. Here the tree allows you to select how the metal will be treated. The options are plated, painted, and heat treated. The system will let you select any, all, or none of these choices. Continuing to the next area, the tree prompts for length, width, and thickness variables, and it will make a calculation to determine how many tons of pressure are required to bend the piece. Then the system compares the variable calculated previously against the press capacities of 50, 100, 1,000, and 9,999. When the variable is equal to or less than one of these constants, the system selects the appropriate branch. In this case, the selection shows you what size press is needed, thus finishing the tree traversal. Got it? Well, I think so, but there must be a decision table available for that. Why not use it? Trees used with D-Class are high-level logic structures. They go way beyond the previous approaches that use decision tables. D-Class is specifically designed for today's problems. 
It can handle complex relationships, multiple changing conditions, and loosely defined methodology, which manual decision tables just don't handle very well. Decision tables used to be useful tools for capturing decision-making logic because they allowed various conditions and actions to be defined. But decision table systems always had three big problems. First, they were a headache to create. Second, they were hard to maintain and keep up to date, especially in a changing environment. And third, they were difficult to visualize. On the other hand, trees are so easy to visualize that even semi-skilled people can understand them. They're easy to expand and easy to maintain. You can convert decision table logic into equivalent trees if you want. One user experienced in both approaches told us that trees are about 10 times easier to create and maintain than decision tables. Well, what about the coding we're using now? Can we convert it over? Sure. The D-Class system can accommodate our company's coding system along with many others like British, Opitz, my class, MDSI code, BYU's part family code. It's really flexible. There are two other approaches of Ben that came along the end. One is fuzzy logic uh, that you've heard about, artificial intelligence to try to do complex decision making. But the real challenge of that is it's hard to tell which rules are in your database trigger which things. It's very difficult to do that. And the other one is uh, one that we used uh, after this. Uh, just using uh, uh, relational database technology. But again, you have to hire programmers. And it's out of the control of the expert. Now he's waiting in line in the queue to get his database uh, working. So we, you know, the possibility of using this is still here today. Uh, any questions uh, before we adjourn? Are yes. the companies still using this technology? I don't know of it. Uh, there could be, uh, but Fortran is kind of obsolete anymore. Uh, Ken had some experiences in using this up in uh, uh, Idaho Nuclear, he might tell you about this more recent thing. Yes? Um, I had a question on uh, using that technology. If you were to modernize it using, using your same code, do you feel like you